Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On today's video, we will be exploring the much-hyped Netflix apocalyptic thriller Bird Box, following a group of survivors in a world where a mysterious force has decimated the human race, where only one thing is certain. If you see it, you die. As soon as Bird Box premiered on Netflix, I've been absolutely barraged by requests to cover it, more than any movie that quickly in the channel's history. And when learning that it racked up 45 million views in one week, it was clear that the movie is huge even already inspiring a ton of different memes. That's how you know you've really made it. In reality, the movie itself is good, with especially high production value and cast for a streaming movie, and certainly does have some intriguing world building as well. It's also more than a bit melodramatic, and has characters making inexplicably stupid decisions that lead to grave consequences. So it's kind of a mixed bag in that sense. And of course, comparisons have been drawn with this and last year's big hit, A Quiet Place, but the original story for Bird Box was written well before for this despite their general similarities. Also in that movie you actually did see the monsters, which is not the case with Bird Box. Many people found the choice of not showing the monsters to be frustrating, but there is a specific reason in the story for this choice, which we will be looking at in this video along with many other details to the monsters, putting together our best understanding of what they are and how they work, as well as looking at other possible lingering questions about the story. Pretty much, I'm going to try to answer any question I had about the movie when watching, and will attempt to cover everything about the movie in depth. So, let's dig into Bird Box, breaking down the story, what we learn about the monsters along the way, and explaining the ending. Unfolding in two different timelines, we switch back and forth with five years after a massive apocalyptic incident with a woman, Mallory, along with two children on their way down a river, all wearing blindfolds. Instructed by Mal to keep them on at all times or they'll die. And flashing back to her five years earlier, seeing when things first went to hell. She was pregnant at the time, and it seems to have maybe not been an ideal situation. As as her so-called roommate is already out of the picture. As such, she doesn't have the typical maternal glow about her unborn child, treating it as something not real in order to distance herself emotionally. Which, guess what, is going to be Mallory's big character arc for the movie. Stay tuned! Already elsewhere in the world, some strange and horrifying events are occurring. Masses of people going insane and committing suicide. It appears to have begun in Russia and quickly spread across Europe. But Mal brushes it off as no concern being so far away. Until a map shows us the possibility of it reaching Alaska. And in fact, it's already too late, and the plague has spread here. On the way out of the hospital, seeing a woman violently bashing her head into a window to kill herself, a strange colored glaze in her eye. The streets are already in absolute chaos, made even worse when Jessica starts to become emotional. Tears in her eyes, asking what the fuck is that? Before her eyes crust over, and she starts to swerve erratically crashing the car. Even though both managed to survive the wreck, Jessica Jessica's not done yet, walking out into the street and is promptly smashed by a garbage truck. Uh, guess that was all they could afford of Sarah Paulson. Anyway, thanks for the cameo. Mallory tries to make her way through stampedes of frantic people until getting mowed down, which is spotted by a woman, Lydia, outside of her house who wants to help her, despite her grumpy husband Douglas's urging that it's a bad idea. Suddenly, just like Jessica, something catches Lydia's attention, staring out in surprise, seeing her mother and begging for her to not go, her eyes then changing and she calmly walks into a flaming car, burning herself to death. With a good Samaritan, Tom's aid, Mal is carried into the house, seeing there's even more people already shacked up there. Places start to get pretty crowded. They gather around, each telling of similar experiences to what we just witnessed. Those around them suddenly driven to killing themselves, with the older woman describing feeling a presence at the time. And Charlie, who is a writer literally working on an apocalyptic novel, has this whole thing pretty much figured out. This is another one of those things, like I've said before, if someone has a big monologue or there's a classroom scene, chances are that's pretty important for the movie. And this time is no different. According to him, these invisible entities have many different names in various cultures, but the creature's intent are all the same, to wipe out humanity, taking the form of our greatest fears or worst loss before judgment. This is why the creatures are never seen because they take on a different appearance for each particular person. As we saw in Lydia's death, as she first saw the entity, she believed she was seeing her dead mother. So that is the form it had taken for her and changes for each person it claims. As far as its specific way of taking its victims, one of the names Charlie mentions when referring to the demons is Aka Mana, which means evil purpose or evil intention. And certainly brutally taking one's own life fits in with this MO. The creature's essentially taking over its victim's mind with these evil intentions. Though oddly, there was at one point a scene that ended up being cut that did show the 
monster in some form, which apparently looks so stupid that Sandra Bullock couldn't stop laughing when filming with it, so it was thankfully cut. Good thing they didn't leave it in because it could have ruined the whole movie if the monster looked as dumb as we've heard. In our next flash forward, we get a bit more on the monster's behavior, as well as the relevance of the titular bird box. Six hours on the river, Mal reaches out on a walkie-talkie, getting loud static feedback in return, and birds in the box start freaking out and losing it, functioning in a similar capacity to a canary in a coal mine. Both of these things, the static and the birds, are warning signs of the monster's presence, hearing a whispering, growling voice calling out Mallory's name. But the trio stay under their blanket until the threat eventually passes. Back in the past, the house gets even more crowded when another woman, Olympia, knocks at the front door asking for help. Douglas, of course, argues not to open the door, but they do it anyway to his annoyance. And surprisingly, Olympia is pregnant too, and looks about as far along as Mal. Hopefully that won't be a problem in the near future, which of course it will be. I gotta say, out of all the survivors, I feel like I relate the closest to Doug. Maybe not quite as much of an a-hole as him, but he's right to want to keep people out, since he just let Mal and others in, losing his wife in the process. So I'm kind of on his side through this whole thing. Screw everyone else, we gotta look out for ourselves, people! Maybe that makes me a bad person. Yeah, it probably does. Oh well, forget it. Worried about their already running low food supplies and another mouth to feed, they don't know how to get supplies if they can't see. But Greg has an idea that will prove disastrous, using the house's security cams to try and see the creatures on the video monitors. Perhaps if it's just pixels and heat, seeing them won't have the same effect. Left alone, Greg pours over the monitors, catching what will become the telltale sign of the monsters approaching, an eerie wind that picks up out of nowhere, scattering leaves in a path around it, even seeing a figure's obscured silhouette approaching. And when he sees it, Greg's eyes scab over, found by the other slamming his head over and over into the desk, killing him. Well, so much for that idea. Doug muttering him, he told him it was a mistake. Jeez, cold hearted. He's just like, you're all dead and dumb, dude. Way to go. Everyone's starting to lose hope. It's time for Betty Buys. And Olympia tries to connect with Mal, both being pregnant and all. But Mal continues to be emotionally closed off, getting uncomfortable and leaving when questioned about her relationship situation. 14 hours on the river, Mal and the kids meet a shocking new kind of antagonist. Rolling through a heavy fog, they hear a man's voice asking if they need help and encouraging them to take their blindfolds off. Everything is fine. We, of course, would think this is the creature's doing, as we already heard it mimicking a voice at six hours, but this time things are different, as there is a real man there amongst the fog, a pretty bumpkin-y looking guy who turns aggressive, trying to wrestle the gun away from Mal, saying he's already seen it and that it's beautiful. But Mal ain't having it, taking a big old knife to the guy and slashing the absolute shit out of him. Woo, go Sandy! Leaving him dying to sink in the river, muttering about how everyone needs to see it. All right, so this weirdo was able to survive after glimpsing the entity, at least until getting sliced and diced. What makes him so special? Well, that isn't made too obvious initially, becoming more clear in the past when the group have an encounter with a similar individual when they go on a supply run. They black out the windows of their Jeep, using the GPS to navigate their way to Charlie's supermarket, in a part that feels like a bizarre ad for Jeep. Even in the apocalypse, you can get to Whole Foods with our magical GPS. Look at how the precision turning swiftly avoids those flaming cars in the road. Hey, you guys comfortable back there? <laughs> Thought so. The Jeep Cherokee has comfortable seating for seven, you know. Anyway, they arrive at the store, here first discovering the useful alert system that the birds play, as a loud knocking at the back loading dock door draws their attention. A guy outside begging to be let in. Tom, ever the blindly good Samaritan, reasons he has to let him in. That's a person out there! Well, yeah, but that doesn't mean you can trust him. But Charlie recognizes the man's voice as his co-worker, Fish Fingers, remembering him as a bit crazy but nice. And they decide to open the door. Immediately, Fish Fingers claws at them, going on about wanting them to see it. And Charlie springs into action, sacrificing himself to push the threat away, and they seal the door closed. Moments later, a pool of Charlie's blood collecting under the door after taking his life. Well, sure, he did save them, but it seems a bit much. Couldn't he have just pushed the guy out of the way without tackling him? Like, go up to the door, whoo, pushed him out, and I'm still alive. Oh well. Since no one is around five years later, I guess they've all got to go at some point. So we begin to understand why some specific people aren't driven to kill themselves after seeing the monsters, those that have some kind of mental issues, and who now go around forcing others to see for themselves. Which seems to be a little too straightforward in my opinion, but there you go. No further explanation is given on the matter. The rest make it safely back to the house, but selfishly the cop lady Lucy and the drug dealer guy Felix decide to take the car for themselves and leave. What's really 
really weird about this is we don't ever see these characters again. I really was waiting for them to pop up dead or as other crazy believers or whatever, but nope, they just drive right out of the movie to never be heard from again. Later guys! Not long after another weary traveler comes a knocking at the front door asking for help. And all alone, Olympia makes the extremely stupid choice to let him in. And Douglas and I are once again on the same page when Gary begins to lay out his story, mentioning escape patients from a mental hospital, and Doug doesn't buy it, feeling something is off about him. But a sneak attack from the old lady stops him in his tracks and winds up getting locked in the garage. Oh geez, just because he pointed a gun at somebody, what's the world coming to? Olympia does feel guilty for letting him in, calling herself soft from being loved, and adamantly demands from Mal to take care of her baby if something happens to her. After being really relentless about it, Mal finally agrees, but assuring her, don't worry, nothing's gonna happen to you. Yeah, right. Anytime a conversation like this is had in a movie, that means she ain't gonna make it. And right on cue, Olympia suddenly starts going into labor, followed not long after by Mallory's water breaking, Double baby whammy. Meanwhile, Gary is taking the moment to chill, putting on some music and taking a seat, proceeding to pull out a stack of different drawings, all of which must be different incarnations of the monsters, or at least his interpretation of what he's seen, many of which resemble the creatures from the work of author H.P. Lovecraft, who frequently dealt with the fear of the unknown, which fits right in with these invisible monsters. Obviously, Gary is a big fat liar like Doug thought, and is another believer slash crazy person that survived what he saw. Now, here to spread the message they find so beautiful. He begins by sticking their birdcage in the fridge and tearing off the paper covering the windows from outside. Tom almost does something worthwhile, but gets knocked out with a can of beans or something, and Gary opens the garage on Doug, surely dooming him to die. Just after each baby has been delivered, he makes his way upstairs, creepily asking to see and hold them, then pulling up the shades, letting the light in. Olympia sees the entity first, considering after all, it's not so bad. Mal gets the baby away from her just as she leaves leaps out, tumbling out to her demise. Gary then forces the old lady to look, peeling her eyes open to see and a thousand memes were launched as her eyes crust and she stabs herself in the neck with a pair of scissors. A miraculously alive Doug appears, winging Gary in the shoulder, but gets rushed, both falling over the railing. And instead of letting Doug see, Gary kills him himself with the scissors, at least apologizing to him for not getting to see it before he dies. Off screen, hearing gunshots, a newly conscious Tom takes out Gary and comes to Mal and the newborn's aid. Then we jump to five years later, a bit of time before Mal's journey on the river, still living with Tom and the two now several year older children. The time surviving only has hardened Mallory's distance, coldly teaching the kids how to listen to the different distances of sounds while wearing blindfolds, and has yet to even name them, referring to them only as boy and girl respectively, because she still can't accept the responsibility of being their mother and the emotional support required. Their seemingly serene life is ended when out on a supply run, Mal catches sight of a group of the believers stalking the area, who at this point are like generic gangs with machine guns driving around in luxury cars. Okay, sure. The area no longer safe. They are given potential salvation when a signal comes in on their walkie from a man named Rick who says he has a compound that's safe down by the river's end, getting some vague detail about how to find this supposed sanctuary. Mal isn't so sure about this Rick guy in his story, and after all, how could they possibly trust him? But Tom, on the other hand, thinks they don't have a choice to stay at this point. And on their next run as a group, they break into another abandoned house, finding the holy treasure of stale strawberry Pop-Tarts. They gather around to savor their wondrous bounty until their moment of family bonding is interrupted by tires squealing outside. The same crazy hooligans from earlier, all armed to the teeth. Which, why would they want guns or to shoot someone if what their real purpose is is to see their god or whatever? Not really the same thing. Okay, it doesn't matter. Tom gives himself up to the group to allow Mal and the kids a distraction, but they plainly see them running by. So Tom has no choice but to retaliate, opening fire and nailing some of the guys before removing his blindfold and laying waste to the whole crew minus one nutball. As the wind begins to rustle, leaves flinging into the air, Tom's eyes begin to change, getting the last guy tended to before turning the gun on himself. Even though it's a bummer to lose Tom, at least he went out like a boss. Hearing Tom's final gunshot, Mal is devastated, but pulls herself together with a new determination, preparing for their final last ditch chance. The treacherous two day journey down the dangerous river with the two kids, based on the advice of a stranger on the radio. Sounds like a solid choice. Now coming up on 42 hours in and the most dangerous final stretch of the trip, approaching 
Flushing Rapids, Rick said that someone had to look to navigate it. But Mal so far was unable to decide which child to look as she has to paddle. In the end, deciding to screw it all and ain't nobody gonna look, we gotta get through these BS rapids, no problemo. Their tiny boat is knocked all over the place as the rapids gain speed, eventually capsizing the boat, sending Mal swimming to retrieve the boy on a rock while getting dragged through the current. On the shore, hearing the many chirps of birds in the forest, they know they are getting close to the destination. But the monsters aren't about to give up, hearing her sister's voice to open her eyes, followed by Doug's voice and then several others. Mal tries to convince herself it's not real, but trips over a twig and tumbles down a hill getting separated from the kids. The boy is almost convinced by the entity using Mal's voice to take off his blindfold, and Jessica's voice returns, the noise drowning everything else out, until Mal, desperate and finally admitting to herself that she cares about the kids, yells, do not take my children, causing the monster's noises to subside, allowing her to track down the kids thanks to the sound of their bells. They're stopped in their tracks by a familiar voice, Tom's also reassuring them that it's safe here. Snatching the kids up and running, more tracks of other monsters are seen all heading in their direction, making it to a door and getting safely inside. Phew, they made it to what we learn is a school for the blind. Since they cannot see, they are unable to be judged by the monsters. I did like this aspect to the story, that something that could be considered a disability actually winds up being advantageous to these people. Rick takes them inside to a room full of other kids and birds singing. Now truly seeing what the bird box of the title was referring to. This safe haven Mal has found for her children, officially bestowing them real names and referring to herself as their mother. As the kids join the others, she looks finally relaxed and at peace, knowing that at least she did what she set out to do, finding a safe place for her family, which as long as they don't randomly let people in, will be safe and sound for the foreseeable future. But more importantly, Mal has finally been able to shed her emotional distance and open up herself to the possibility of hope in the future, despite what the the outside world has become. A small glimmer of hope in a world of death and misery. There you go. With that, we have reached the conclusion of this video on Bird Box. Hopefully I answered all the questions you guys had about the movie. If not, leave them in the comments below. Also, don't forget you can send me a video request for movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of Bird Box and its ending? What do you think the monsters really are? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.